The UEE would like to remind you, when harvesting marijuandite, please remember to wear your gas mask. Marijuandite particles are highly intoxicating and effects will vary. The results could be as mild as Captain Schuster, who lost seven hours and missed his delivery time because he thought he was a bowl of petunias, to something as severe as Captain Phelps, who piloted his ship into several head-on collisions with small asteroids, believing himself to be a hungry space whale. Please... Mine responsibly. Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Citizens. I am Bridger, I'll be your host for today, where we are talking all about the economy of Star Citizen. But not just that, we're tying in the economy into the whole paying to win thing. Because the economy is directly linked into paying to win when you have real money interacting with the economy at all. And that's one of the major features that we're going to be talking about today. But before we go there, let me introduce myself and my co-host. Again, I am Bridger. I'll be your host for today. You can go to www.talesofcitizens.com to keep track of all of the, uh, the show notes if you want to get any of the links to any of the different things that we talked about today. And uh, that's just going to go back to, you know that because I took too long. <laughs> All right. Welcome. Also joining us today, we have my good friend and co-host Kalathulu. Welcome, sir. Uh, do apologize for the quality of my voice. It will stay low, but it will probably be a little nasally, which is an interesting combination, usually only possible in high helium environments. Ah. Well, that's, that's good, because it means that mine will just sound that much better by comparison. <laughs> All right, so we always start out each show with a segment that we like to call Life in the Verse, where we just briefly talk about what's going on with us and what we're doing these days. So uh, as far as myself, uh, well, Team Legacy is, is the corporation slash guild slash gaming community that I'm involved with, and you're, we're ramping up our Star Citizen uh events and, and getting everything organized in preparation. Uh, they've been mentioning that the organization system is going to launch pretty soon, and that's where we're going to start our big, you know, recruiting drive. It's going to be a good time. But, you know, I went and did something that I probably shouldn't have done. This is confession time, all right? I watched Wing Commander. I know, I know. I just... I had to do it. I saw somebody on the subreddit posted that they were going to watch Wing Commander, and I said... You know, it couldn't be that bad, right? <laughs> no, it, it can be that bad. It can be that bad. It really can. Oh, man. The thing that got me the most, there's a part in it where Freddie Prince Jr., the hero, and love interest, I don't remember her name, um, were both on the final mission to go and save the, save the world. Uh, and, and Freddie Prince Jr. was going to jump to Earth and warn the fleet, and she was with him. And then what had come up on their, on, their mis on, on, their, on their radar system was a skipper missile that could only be destroyed by uh, a pilot with visual confirmation. So the love interest went off to destroy it, and she's like, you keep going. Don't worry, I'll handle this. And, and they're going back and forth between her trying to get a lock and closing on this thing and trying to kill it. And they go back to the bridge of the Tiger Claw, which is the carrier that the missile is going after. And the, the people on the bridge is like, we don't have the shields to take another hit. And then they're like, 40 seconds out. And they go back to her and she's shooting and missing. And it's like 30 seconds and she's almost got it. And then it's like 10 seconds. And then she just blows it up just literally in the nick of time. Like when having closed till she's like 30, 40 yards away. And the explosion <laughs> damages her craft she has to eject, right? Suddenly, suddenly, just instantaneously, Freddie Prince is there, and the cockpits are, like, almost touching each other, and he's looking through the cockpit, and he's like, don't worry, I'm going to tow you in. She's like, no, you got to move on. you got to get going. It's very important that your mission succeed. And he's like, but you only have an hour's worth of air. You'll die in there. She's like, it's more important that your mission succeeds. And it's supposed to be this very touching moment. And all I could think yeah. to the back of my head, I'm like, they were 10 seconds away. If the camera pulls back, the freaking carrier will be literally right there. It's like a football field away. And they're having this conversation <laughs> over, I can't just let you die. They'll never find you in time. <laughs> well, it, it could be that UEE sensors are really crap. Um, <laughs> so they won't find her in time, which is why you need the visual confirmation. I guess. But uh, I would say, Bridger, if anything, that... 
the existence of the Dungeons and Dragons movie tells us that no matter how much you love something, the movie can still be crap. Wasn't Dave Chappelle in that? Yes, he. Well, no, it wasn't Chappelle. It was the who Wayans was brothers. Oh, the Wayans brothers. That's who. Yes, it was. one of them at least. Yeah, <laughs> he was like the the bungling idiot. I remember. Oh man, that was. Oh yes. Bad. Okay. Snail. Let's... If you. Snail. His name was Snail. His name was Snail. <sighs> yeah. Okay. See, it just gets better. It does just get better. All right. So, what's been going on with you recently, Calabulu? <clears throat> Uh, in as much as gaming goes, I've been enjoying uh, Planet Side 2 quite a bit. They made a massive update a while back mm-hmm. called the Performance Update 2. And then they've done these little incremental updates since. So actually it's, it's a, a game that's really easy on the, uh, really easy on the, uh, the resources comparatively now when you're trying to game and the mm-hmm. lag is pretty minimal. But they just released a new fighter update, and I, I, I started this whole thing to get a little more experience with some of the flight models, not knowing what to expect. Uh, it's not a flight model for Star Citizen, but it is a pretty cool flight model just in general. They made a massive update for uh, their fighter, their fighters in the game, and it's, uh, it's a, you know, from the ground up, it's an awesome combat game. So if you want to get your first person skills honed in there, and you love sci-fi, it's a lot of fun. I'd recommend it. So, do you fly with a stick or with a mouse and keyboard in Planet Side? Right now, mouse and keyboard because I cannot figure out how to get the stick working in there. Oh, I've tried, man. It's it's a nightmare trying to get a <laughs> stick to work. They just they because the problem is the code that they use in there is for mm-hmm. consoles. It's for it's for um, joysticks on like a joypad, on like a game. Yeah. Pad. So it doesn't for whatever reason it just doesn't have the sensitivity to deal with a full size joystick. I guess. Yeah, and you and of course the joystick's got that that dead zone right in the middle, where you you yeah. look to the left, look to the right, nothing happens, then you go past the Basically that wall, the, and it's yeah. The main problem that people have identified is that dead zone is huge, and you can't make it any smaller than it currently is because they yeah. just basically we need joystick support. Okay, well these game pads have joysticks. Just take that and just import it into the game. Oh yeah, that'll work, no problem. So I guess and it works if you want to fly with a three sixty controller, but the yeah, I mean I. I've got one, but that's not why, not why I wanted to fly it. But uh, I've really enjoyed the game for just being the game. So my initial goal is out the window. Uh, but otherwise, uh, if you if you are a fan of weird weird kind of science fictiony stuff, Rick and Morty, for the people that bring you Adventure Time and Bravest Warrior. Hmm. What is, so is that? It, a, it, what is that a, available on? Is that a, a uh, cartoon? Well, you can. You can try and catch the clips of it off of Comedy Central. They're airing it on not Comedy Central, uh, Adult Swim. They air it on Adult Swim every night, okay, and uh, or once a week. I don't know the schedule, but uh, or you can you know, do a Google search. You'll find something, but not that I you know condone that kind of thing. But uh, just weird mad scientist sci-fi. If, if I if you could make the ship some kind of mobile meth lab in space, I think you'd have Rick and Morty. Ah. Okay. Yeah, just the, the delusion of flying around, yeah. That's what it's, I'm it's a doing. cool little show, so check it out. And for those that may be interested in trying to get uh, Planet Side 2 joysticks to work, the best way that I've been able to do it is using Joy 2 Key and basically emulating the uh, mouse for your joystick. Yeah. Uh, I did yeah. manage to get that working and making it feel fairly good. But <laughs> anyway, uh, we're moving on now to Star Citizen. Um, <laughs> and we're going to start with something that we haven't yet experienced here on the Tales of Citizens. So those of you who have participated and watched any of my previous shows will understand what's about to happen. See, the problem is I have to prevent myself from going to the forums every once in a while. I think your mic just got switched <laughs> to the other mode. Um, because when I go to the official forums, I just get so enraged every time and when I get this frustrated anger inside of me I have to vent and when I vent it's called a bridge rant that's right ladies and gentlemen <laughs> so I'm going to the RSI forums and I just like I haven't been here in a while I've been trying to stick to the subreddit you know star citizen because it's just so much more calming there's just good discussion in there nobody's making my my head pop off and then I stumble across this thread and this thread is called 
understanding the metagame, an inside look at metagaming methods and the metagame playbook. And this is somebody coming from EVE trying to explain why it's okay to do these things. And he says, controlling the economy, like using your your wealth and power to try and, you know, mess around and get advantages and things. That's good, that's part of the game and all this other stuff. And he doesn't understand what metagame is. Metagaming means outside the game, and he's describing using game mechanics. So there's this first fundamental problem with this entire post is it's, in, it's titled wrong. But not only is it titled wrong, the whole concept that other people think that this is metagaming and that it's bad prompted him to post this in the first place. So now we have to come to the point where I have to wrestle with the fact that people don't want you to play the game using the tools at your disposal to try and achieve your goals. They say, no, 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 you're not allowed to use all the tools you want. You're only able to use the ones that I tell you are okay. Here's a toolbox, but you can only use the screwdriver and the hammer, but only the Phillips head. You can't use the other one because that would be cheating. You can't cheat, it's a sandbox game. Metagaming is something that takes place outside of the game. It has to do with forums, or it has to do with trying to hack the game or DDoS it. Those are metagaming techniques. That's cheating, that's hacking, that's a problem. If you're just using the systems in the game to make yourself rich, fucking thumbs up, okay? I can't, I can't take it. What if people are gonna use their their power to blockade systems and not let anybody in? I wanted to go trade there, but they won't let me trade. Yes! Yes. All I have to say is yes. And then I leave the forums and I go pet my dog so that I don't have to get angry anymore. <laughs> You did mention your Valium was under your keyboard, so keep an eye out for Oh, that. yes! Oh, no, I'm all out. Oh, well. <laughs> so, I, ugh, it, it drives yeah. me crazy. It really does. And uh, it kind of does pertain directly to today's conversation. Cause, and the, you know what's really frustrating? It's not that these people are wrong. And there are some people that are right. There's some people on there trying to keep sanity in check because I did notice that when I went to Wikipedia to get the definition of metagaming to tell these people why they were wrong, I looked and somebody else had already posted it. Uh, so I was like, <laughs> good, that's good. Somebody else is at least there the is also the same. Exactly. But the problem is anytime I find somebody that I need to correct or I need to, 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 to argue with or debate, like I love doing that. I love talking about things and trying to, you know, argue and persuade. Like those are my favorite things to do. But, uh, what happened? I made things go away on here, didn't I? Uh, possibly. <laughs> the form, the, everything, yep. all the color, all the covers have disappeared on the video, as if we had to go one week without something going wrong. So the covers no. fell off. So, <laughs> anyway, if I could just post and convince these people, then I would feel better. The problem is. By the time I'm finished writing my post, there'll be 20 other posts in a thread that's already 20 pages long, and I feel like nobody's even gone to bother to read what I say, because I didn't bother to read the first seven pages either, knowing that I would just get enraged by the things that I saw there. So really, the well, problem no is there's too many people. You know? I do, but I also like how in the, in the, the thread you linked, the last point there was control the forms. And he says, as as if this was a good thing, get a lot of people together who want to try and change the game, or I'm sorry, get a get a, a large group of people who are still a minority of the population, who want to who want to change the game or the way the game plays to their own advantage, and then bomb the crap out of a company's complaints department and forums and everything else using fake accounts and. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, basically, he's he's discussing what you call an astroturf campaign, where a candidate makes an issue seem more important than it is, or a special interest group, by basically writing to media outlets as if they were concerned citizens, thousands of them, tens of thousands of them, mildly changing the wording so as not to get picked up as automatically a copy, and then take an issue which no one cares about and make it something that seems important. Or what I like to call the Kardashian coverage. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's no other way the Kardashians could exist unless they had hired a special interest group to astroturf for them. So therefore, but you know that's that's not even just bad. You know, gaming outside of the game to get things changed the way you want it to. That's just being an asshole. Yeah. And, you know, that's the only thing in his entire thread that counts as metagaming and the only thing that I take issue with as well. Go Agreed. Figure. <laughs> All right. So next up, let's dive into the main topic here because this one is one I've been looking forward to personally for a very long time. Let's talk all about the economy. But first, let's talk about what this game is. I mean, what Star Citizen is really impacts how we look at it as a game and as an economy and as, well, everything, really. So let's talk about what kind of game is Star Citizen? People would say an MMO, right? It was massively multiplayer online game. Um, sure. But it's also defined as like a sandbox game, right? How would you define well, it? Well, I think a, a... I actually had this conversation at one point. It is a MMO space economy simulator. You know, just like the other, like the Wing Commander games and uh, um, Privateer, you know, those other games, they, they are very open world, you know, what you call the sandbox earlier, which is entirely accurate because there is no set of objectives that you have to meet constantly and you've got a lot of uh, time or, you know, do it your own way kind of aspects to meeting those objectives. Uh, you know, assuming there is like a storyline but, you know, I'd say it's, it's an economy simulator. Yes, there are ships. Yes, they shoot at each other. But the, the broader picture is you got goods from port A to port B, and how do you get them there or who tries to take them from you? And, and you know, at its base, that is the game. Do you think a good definition for a sandbox game would be a game that you can't actually beat because there is no win condition? Well... Not necessarily. I mean, you know, the if, if the way you beat the game was to collect every ship, you know, I would say yes and no. It's a game with a lot of objectives and no clear path to to achieve those objectives, but there is no victory condition. Yeah, I mean, just just comparing it to other typical games that we expect. Okay. You know, Mario has has a way to beat the game. You can finish all of That's the levels. True finish all of the content, and then the credits roll, right? Yes. Half-Life has that. Uh, pretty much any game that's not strictly multiplayer, like a League of Legends kind of situation, <laughs> has the ability to beat the game. If we're talking sort of single-player games, um, or even multiplayer co-op games, like Borderlands, it's possible to yeah. beat Borderlands, even though it's a multiplayer game. That's true, game. there is an end boss. So, yeah, and, no, obviously... That's, that's... We've had sandbox-style games before, EVE Online being the biggest and most obvious <laughs> one that's been around for a very long time. So sure. I'd like to bring up the definition, and, and here's the problem. And there's a link in the show notes to a very good video, which I highly recommend everybody check out. It's by a couple of uh, other podcasters that do a podcast called Geek Nights. And <laughs> they hit upon the way that we can try to define games. I mean... The problem with defining something as a game versus not a game is that, as they point out, very often when somebody tries to define a game, they're doing it in order to exclude something, and they're only doing it to show disrespect towards one thing and respect towards another. So if somebody says, this is a game and this isn't a game, often what they're trying to do is saying, I respect this, I don't respect that, you know? Mm. So... That's a real problem trying to come up with the word game because it's such a broad word. But academically, in order to intelligently talk about games and game design, we have to be able to split them up and divide them into categories of like and similar features, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. So there was a great definition for what we consider typical or, or gamers games that was coined by Richard Garfield, who is the guy who made Magic the Gathering, amongst other mm -hmm. things. And he wrote a great book called Characteristics of Games, which I'm working my way through and is very good. Highly recommended to anybody who likes game design. Very, very mm -hmm. cool. He defined it as ortho games. And his definition is a competition between two or more players using an agreed upon set of rules and a method of ranking. So this covers pretty much everything from League of Legends 
to even things like Half-Life or single-player first-person shooters or even something like Puzzle Quest or Pokemon because the AI or the computer in those situations counts as one of the players. And the method of ranking is whether you get to the end or not. So... Hmm. To, to his definition, the other player would be the computer. Now, they don't necessarily have to play by the same rules. In a game like Pokemon, the computer's playing by a different set of rules. It's got a very structured system where it tries to prevent the player from getting past it. And if the player mm. gets past it, the player, quote-unquote, wins that, in, that set of encounters or what have you. So that obviously excludes a lot of other games, including sandbox games and other kind of experiential games like Dungeons and Dragons doesn't really fit into that. So the Geek mm. Knights guys decided to coin the, the term Ideo Game as opposed to Ortho Game. Uh, yeah. So Ideo Game, they defined as a series of interesting decisions that produce a personal outcome. So this does include things like Dungeons and Dragons, which is clearly yeah. a game, but it's not a game like chess is a game. Chess is an ortho game. Dungeons and Dragons is more of an ideal game. So again, this is not to say this is a game. That's not a game. It's not worth worrying about. This is just to do to... different games. Exactly. They're they're we're, we're trying to break them up into light categories so we can talk about them intelligently. That's what academia does. That's why we have so many big <laughs> words for anything in academia. <laughs> well, the socioeconomic influences of what you're saying. I'm just <laughs> So, all right, getting back to space. I think it's pretty clear that Star Citizen fits right into the ideal game category because there isn't a, uh, a method of ranking, which is what takes it out of the ortho game category. So what do you think? Obviously, people are going to make up their own rules and goals within Star Citizen. Do you think there's one that everybody is going to probably think of as the goal? Like, everybody is just by default going to have this as the ultimate goal. Uh, well, for everybody, the ultimate goal? No. But depending on what the player well, let's say is many to players. Accomplish, What's the biggest goal yeah. that the most people are going to say, this is what I want to achieve ultimately? If you're a, a trader, owning a factory. Okay. We know that there's a concept for that. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, therefore, I, I would see that as being kind of the, the be-all, end-all of the individual trying to work their way up in space, finding an AI factory, purchasing it, and then producing goods from it. So, uh, I was thinking more along the lines of owning, like, a Bengal. <laughs> like, I think everybody's going to want well, to have, like, the goal of their organization is to one day own a Bengal. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the organizations, especially the military ones, that might be their goal. If you are an organization focused on combat, either piracy or bounty hunting or you know taking it to the Van Duel, uh, you may want a Bengal as the goal, one with you know a fully kitted out flight deck and everything else. Um, but you know, if, as the individual players, I mean, an individual player owning a Bengal or running one is probably going to be pretty tricky, especially because you won't have the fighter screen. I think, probably, if we were to break it down and just do a poll, like, what is going to be, what, which of these will be your goals in the game? We just gave a huge list of goals. I yeah. think the one that the most people would check would probably be get filthy, stinking rich. That will be entirely accurate. That in, in any sandbox game that includes an economy like this one does, uh, getting money is usually the, the lifeblood of accomplishing what it is you want to accomplish, whatever that is. Yeah. So, you know, if you're a pirate, you're going to want to hit the biggest the biggest cargo carriers. If you're a bounty hunter, you go to the biggest bounties you can go after without losing your ship. And if you're a merchant, you go after the most lucrative trade routes until eventually you get enough money to do whatever it is you want to do. Now, for some people, like myself, you play as a merchant to get a massive bankroll, and then you go into combat with the neatest, best toys and see what you can do. And, so uh, there's and another set of goals. As somebody in the chat pointed out, uh, the other really interesting thing is that, for example, pirates might see like a very high, like I want to be the the one person in the entire universe with the highest bounty, and still yeah, be alive, right? Yeah, that's a that would be a fun goal to have. Yeah. So there's a lot of little sub goals, but I think getting rich is probably a, un a nearly universal goal that everybody is going to have in some way. Now, yeah. that having been said. Since we have the goal of getting rich, since you can simply pay real money to get in-game credits, what do you think? Does that cheapen the experience? 
Well, they've already said that they're massive limiting how you can pay real money in game credits. I mean, it's something like you could spend uh, per day about two hours worth of playtime. I'd have to go double check that form post. So it doesn't look like that's going to cheapen the experience in other than a person can spend real world money to, to save about two hours worth of playtime on a daily basis. Um, so uh, while that may that may dilute the currency a bit, I don't think that's going to cheapen the experience because with only two hours, they'll never be as competitive uh, as far as getting the money. Now, is it really competition to get that money? Maybe. We don't know yet enough about the game to do it. But I don't see that as diluting the experience as much as people fear it might. You know, I won't say that it would have no impact, but... You know, there are other games where you can spend real-world money to get stuff. I mean, Planetside 2, you can get new guns. That doesn't cheapen the experience for players that either earn them without paying for it or that uh, don't buy ever buy an extra gun because all of the guns are pretty competitive. Um, and then there are other instances where uh, you know, pay-to-win games designed that way from the top down are just that, and you have to spend real money plus get the playtime in order to in order to really experience the game. We know that Star Citizen isn't being built that way. So I would say that it will not cheapen the experience. Everyone's got an equal footing, but you can spend some cash to get kind of a little edge. I think what it comes down to is especially in ideal games, I mean, let's check the definition again. A series of interesting decisions that produce a personal outcome. Hmm. What it comes down to is this that game sort of embodies the concept of it's not about the destination, it's about the journey, right? Mm, because yes. once you get filthy, stinking rich and you own half the galaxy, what's left to do? Like, what's supposed to be fun is the process of getting more under your... All right. We had a little hiccup there with the stream. It should be back up now. Theoretically, okay, yeah, I see that. As long as XSplit doesn't crash on me again. Hey, look at that. I think we're good. <laughs> Should be coming back up in a second now. Okay, so let's jump back in here. Now that we've got sort of a base, a foundation, and if you want to know more about exactly how the economy works with the node system and, and how things will get created over time, go ahead and check out the alpha boot camp for this episode it should be in the show notes it's also available uh through a link directly in the menus of talesofcitizens.com we're not going to go over all the details of exactly how it works because we can talk about it in there instead we're going to sort of give you some discussion about this so you know how the the node system works and how that all works what do you think i mean they, they mentioned how missions are going to be generated by okay this factory needs uh some raw ore this refinery needs ore and at some point, maybe it starts running low in its stores. Does it, ge it generate its own mission that then has, like, you can, players have, to, like, this mission board they can kind of look at? Do you, is that how you envision it working? Well, yeah, that is that is pretty much what, what they've said. I mean, you know, if factory runs low or runs out, uh, and the lower it gets, the more lucrative that mission becomes. Um, so uh, when the... When the mission gets generated, initially it'll be for you know for a small amount of ore for a small price per unit. But then, as no one satisfies that, you know, the the theory that I was reading was that that price per unit gets bigger, and then the order available gets bigger for the mission that's generated. Um, my hope is that players can also generate some of these missions as well. It would be but interesting, yeah, if you could say, you know, our we're going to have a big operation right for our organization. And mm -hmm. we're going to start, we're going to base at this location, this moon, this planet, whatever, this space station. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, we need a whole bunch of munitions here. We're going to make, we're going to, we know that we're going to need to come here and refuel. We're going to need to come here and get new missiles, more, you know, bullets or whatever, the, the munitions that get used up. We're going to yeah. need, you know, repair kits and all that stuff. Could yeah. you generate a bunch of missions manually that say, you know, we'll pay top dollar for people to bring these things to this location? You know, that would be a really interesting integrated system. And then, of course, yeah, that... you're tipping your hand, aren't you? Now, now the bad guys, your enemies are like, oh, dude. Team Legacy just put out a mission for a bunch of munitions at this location, and then they show up there to try and gank you, but it turns out that it was a trap, 
and you only created those missions to fool them into thinking, and blah, ha, ha, now you're in a Sicilian problem. That they yeah, know, it's... that you know, that I know. Or, or it could also be a way of trying to get new traders to head out there with their brand new ship and then, you know, do a little griefing. Yeah. You know, well, that's not, I guess griefing's not the right word, but going after somebody because they're new, um, you know, is, is a bit of a, a bit of a dick move. Uh, you know, saying, oh, we have this great thing. It's a really common ore, but you have to go all the way to pirate space, but you don't know that because you're new. Uh, yeah. Let's, and so now, then they blow up your ship, make fun of you for a bit, and then try and get you to quit playing. But you know the the quote unquote you know honorable players. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of corporations that want to play the police of the world, that want to collect all those bounties. And when they see a, an obvious trap like that, they're going to come in and come in as the cavalry. You know, they're going to say, okay, you go in there and pretend to be a new player with this you know freelancer trying to bring some some stuff to him and then when they when they come out of nowhere to blow you up we'll we'll appear out of nowhere to save you or something ah that would oh you know it's never going to be as good as we imagine right this is like no, of course this, not. oh i want it to though it'll it, i i have a feeling that a lot of people are going to be slightly disappointed with the game when it officially comes out in 2015 but after a year or two it's going to be a lot closer to what people envision. The problem is the only comparison we have is EVE Online, right? Which has been around for decades now, yeah. over a decade. I guess yeah, it doesn't count as decades. Some time. Almost, almost, yeah, 13? No, no. 2002 is when it came out, right? So 11 years. But almost I'm not even sure EVE Online is a, great, uh, is a great comparison. I mean, yeah, it's all, you know, you got economy, you've got space, but that is a very traditional get in range, click a button, you know, fire an attack, click a button, heal yourself. There's no, like, flight sim aspect to it. That's true. And as long as the combat itself is good, I think people will forgive them the lack of fully featured, you know, <coughs> persistent universe stuff. Because, I mean, the, yeah. what I'm worried about is that all of the cool stuff we're hearing about with the exploration and detection system and this ridiculously in-depth economy and super awesome graphics and all of this stuff and organizations and missions, it's just so big. I mean, maybe yeah. maybe they just have really efficient programmers and they're going to be able to get a bunch of that stuff in. But they've already said <laughs> that not everything is going to be in there at launch. And they have already made very clear that a lot of the stuff that was on the stretch goals isn't going to be in there at launch. Yeah, but it's one of those things that they are they're committed to meeting now that they've agreed to do it. But you know, it's not going to uh, it's not going to necessarily be in there from day one. But that that means we'll have a series of updates, hopefully in relatively good time. Um, but you're right. Anything hyped as much as this game has been hyped, and this is not the fault of the developers, although uh, you know, a little bit uh, Robert Space Industries. Uh, Cloud Imperium Games has has talked about what they want to do, but people have a lot of hope for this game. I mean, they mm -hmm. they've wanted to see a space flight sim happen for a long time, and so no matter what you do, uh, no matter what you do, it's not going to be good enough to meet everybody. And of course, once again, we get back to controlling the forms. People that really wanted Feature X that wasn't in on day one will bomb the hell out of the forms and the customer support to complain to try and get them to change that dot dot dot. Yeah, yeah, that's unfortunate, but true. Now, the... Oh, man, there's just... There's so much stuff going on here. So they also, in the most recent 10 for the chairman, Chris Roberts mm -hmm. talked about contracts and having things being sort of held in escrow as part of, that, a, part of a deal. That sounds really interesting. That actually is bright. Really, a really smart idea. I mean, what's the most common complaint you have about games, you know, MMOs, people interacting in large numbers, especially when you're pseudo-anonymous. Uh, for me, I always heard that it was scams. In EVE, that was a huge problem, although EVE, CCP, to some degree, encouraged some of the scamming by saying there are no rules against it, knock yourself out, in some cases. In other cases where it was taking advantage of an exploit that was not condoned in any way, shape, right. or form. But uh, knock yourself out. And in this one, and the players didn't have tools to do it safely, and that was what got me about CCP's position. When I, I played EVE for several years. Um, you know, there was not, at the time I played, it may have changed afterwards, there was not an escrow house. I and mean, when I buy a home, when I bought, you know, bought my house, I took my money, and I didn't give it to the people trying to sell me the house, I gave it to a company that had a contract with me, so I could legally enforce and go after and sue them if they failed to do so. And, you know, I had tools in place to keep my, my real-world money safe. 
games where it should be easier because you don't have to have any guarantee of trust other than the developers made it so. Uh, should have even better set of tools, but there was nothing. So this is a great idea. Yeah, the the, the main issue is, of course, trust. And he mentioned there will be some sort of rating system. So after you do some kind of a deal with somebody, you can rate them, uh, you know, one to four stars or five stars or whatever. And mm-hmm. that trust rating will sort of go around with you and, and, and it impact you. So, you. so that the really untrustworthy people are going to find it very hard to make honest deals. And you're really only going to have to pretty much work as a pirate and steal stuff from people after if you just make a whole bunch of things where you're ripping people off bad decisions yeah Yeah. now i mean that that kind of and remember both of these games both eve and star citizen are trying in some respect to sort of be life simulators right the reason that you're able to scam people is because that's a part of the appeal is that mm. it, it acts like real life and that there's actual real tension there whenever you go to make a deal. Is this person trustworthy? Have you checked them out enough? And oh, yeah. and that's that's one of the things. When there's something on the line, the game gets more tense and gets more interesting and that gives you the cathartic release when everything goes well or the I'm going to put a giant bounty on that bastard when things go poorly. <laughs> <laughs> I can but just that, see the that's... pirate now, though, trying to explain away the, like... 50,000 credit bounty on their head and somebody like, yeah. no, 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 listen, I've got these. I'm telling you, that was a misunderstanding and some yeah. prick just did that just to mess with me. Trust me, don't worry about it. Yeah, <laughs> just, or... Just bring the stuff. I got the money, no problem. <laughs> but then there's always room for abuse there too. It's bring the stuff, don't worry, no problem. And then they did and then you give them a 50,000 credit bounty and claim it went terribly wrong. But for 100,000, you say you'll take that off. <laughs> oh wait yeah. a minute! So, oh yeah, wait you, a minute! The protection yeah. racket. Oh, I'm gonna put there fifty thousand on your head. There is room for abuse <laughs> in any system. Oh, and if you got someone like me around, then it probably found sooner or later. But <laughs> that's a new kind of insurance fraud, isn't it? To some degree, it, right? Well, you, yeah, and it's you know, Star Citizen during the uh, during the run up to what the the end of the lifetime insurance was. Star Citizen Insurance Simulator. That was a lot of the jokes that came out. <laughs> I can just imagine it now. So somebody has like a $100,000 bounty on their head. They mm. say to their friend, hey, yo, why don't you blow up my ship in UEE area? I'll just fly in a crappy Aurora or something. You blow it up and we'll split the bounty. 50-50. Yeah, which again <laughs> comes down to, I, I think, I, that's why I think that bounties will be missions. And that those missions, you know, again, talk about the economy. Those missions will basically, you know, as you work your way up, end goals in a sandbox game, through a, a bounty hunter's guild, when the mission is generated for them, it gets distributed to somebody, maybe based on hours played or kill oh, counts it'll be or something. You won't be able to choose it. You won't be able to choose it. And moreover, I think this will be cool, if, they, if someone kills the person the bounty's on, when it's not you, and however they determine that, I don't know. Um, then you have other, you know, then uh, the bounty mission gets canceled, you get new, whatever it is. But, uh, excuse me, the point is that that way they can prevent that kind of exploit. But then, on the other hand, it begins to behoove me, if I'm annoyed at somebody, to keep generating large bounties on them just to have people legitimately chasing them and wanting them for that bounty. Well, yeah, of course. That's actually the consequence of being a dick, usually, in these games, right? Well, but That's what if, the what idea. If, what if I, the bounty placer, and the one being the dick? Well, you know what? If you want to spend that much of your money, <laughs> oh yeah, and you know, I don't know. And, and from the pure enjoyment you know, standpoint, I, I think. Uh, so what, you're saying the, the person uh, you're putting the bounty on didn't do anything to justify it all that wrong. grief? <laughs> he's, he's just flying around every day, making a little money, and suddenly there are bounty hunters chasing him down. You know, that sounds like an awesome story, though, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> I was flying around, and suddenly there was a bounty hunter behind me, and I had to punch it, and then I got killed, and then my, my, my brother-in-law took on yeah. the, the, the sort of the, the job of trying to hunt down the person who put this bounty on his brother's head and tried to kill it. That sounds like a great story. Come that, on. Yeah, that, that could be That's a lot actually, of the griefer just made your day less boring and more fun. <laughs> May you live in interesting times. Right. Yes, it the was very much a Chinese proverb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
here's something that I think is really interesting because one of the big differences, and this is, there's two huge differences. This is one of the huge differences between the Star Citizen economy and any other MMO economy I can ever think of, and that is that NPCs run the majority of the economy, and they run it when Which the players aren't there. Can you think of any other game that does anything like that? Nothing that made it mainstream. I mean, there were some... There were some concepts, but they weren't really gaming concepts. It was like a modeling software kind of thing, where people could put inputs into a model, but like you know, economy models just ran. But no, nothing that nothing at this scale, and nothing that made it mainstream like that at all. So the idea is, you know, you the player are now a cog, a very small cog, in a very large machine, and that's pretty cool. That means that you are not the uh, the all important person you thought you were. Yeah. So I think it's really important because I was thinking to myself, they talked about having hundreds of star systems, right? Yes. And they talked about, you know, having, well, we got 300 some odd thousand players, but not obviously not everybody's on at the same time. It's going to grow. Hopefully. Let's say, <laughs> you know, the way that Eve was at least four, maybe three years ago when I started uh, playing again uh, was like 40,000 people on at any given time usually when I happen mm -hmm. to log on. So let's say Star Citizen gets about that, 30,000 and maybe 50,000, somewhere in that range, at any given moment or online. Well, are they all going to be perfectly distributed through every system? No, they're not going to well, be perfectly distributed through every system, but there's going to be some mm -hmm. systems that are dead and some systems that have hundreds of people like Jinta. Is it Jinta? That's um, the name that brings to mind. The yeah, big one, that sounds The right. huge one in, in EVE is Jinta, I think. Or Junta? No. I think it's J-I-N-T. Junta actually sounds more right to me, but Damn. I could be wrong. Somebody in the chat's going to correct me. I'm going to sound like an idiot. I haven't it's okay. I haven't played even a long time, just, just so you know. Okay, so the thing here is, how does the economy in these other areas stay alive if players don't go there? And the answer is this NBC thing. It is, oh, it's Jita. Yeah, J-I-T-A. There you go, Okay, Gita, I was yeah. just throwing an N in there for no reason. Uh, so... That's it's brilliant racist. to me, especially because I don't. Have you ever played any of the tycoon games? Oh yes, uh, all of them. The railroad tycoon, am, for example, is. I am so upset. I am so sad that there is not another railroad tycoon right now that I can play. I've played well, so much of three, and I just want there to be yeah. more. Well, yeah, and the thing is, like, you know, they still actually sell pretty well the old versions on Steam. So talk about known demand. So if there's any game developer out there listening, m my hint to you is take. Take a railroad tycoon, and then just remake that, but better, and you've got it. You've got a hit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and they they did kind of remake it when they made Sid Meier's Railroads, but it was like a baby down yeah. version of it. But I I still go back and I play Railroad Tycoon Three because I love trains and I love yeah. like going. Hey, here's a meat packing factory that has. <laughs> What? Why did I, what's wrong with that example? No, it's, just, it's, not, <laughs> hey, it's a meat packing factory. Really? Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> all right, so maybe a wood pulping factory. Does that? Yeah, here's a lumber mill. Lumber mill. There's a lumber mill, and there's it's not getting a lot of lumber because there's no uh, there's no like uh, lumber yards nearby delivering lumber to it. So. Uh, you buy it when it's real cheap because it's not making any profit. Then you True. build a railway from here to there, and you bring all of the you know trains and train loads of lumber to the lumber mill, and suddenly it starts making a lot of money. So owning those factories and the means of distribution, so you're the guy that does the trading, but you're also the guy that can own the factories, and you have to decide when it's right to sell your factory if somebody wants to buy it. And it's just, oh, I love that cool stuff going on in the railroad tycoons, and I. I can't believe it's being made into Star Citizen because all of these games have always been personal, individual crafting, right? Yeah, I mean, they, yeah, and you know, the NPCs generating all of the, all of the need for it too. So, I mean, I think what was it the, the example that Chris Roberts gave was if you're gonna fly a load of uh, load of iron from. New Pittsburgh to Terra because Terra makes the steel and New Pittsburgh has all the iron production. That's going to be a safe route, but it's not going to get you much. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, if, but if you're going to go out to and actually, Sob took my name on the Twitch. The Twitch feed just mentioned this, and that this is a this is a good point. You know, you're going to go out to some really distant system that has a couple of factories. So you might get that cheap uh, New Pittsburgh iron, but then you fly it way out there. You know, to the space whale, for example. Although I don't think they make much in the way of, of uh, you know, metals. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, you drop that off, and it's going to get you a much higher price per unit for a somewhat longer, somewhat longer travel time, which is which is pretty cool. And, and you know, then you'll also have to set up routes. Like, but the 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 space whale makes a lot of I don't know consumer crap, and consumer crap sells really well on you know Terra, where they don't have enough consumer crap yet. I so they just used that as like one of the boxes. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna load up ten tons of consumer crap. <laughs> yeah, and then there's the indigenous, indigenous, uh, made by the indigenous peoples consumer crap, which was actually made by a factory somewhere else, but separate issue. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> that's just such a cool concept, and I, I, I think it works much better than because the individual crafting idea in Eve always felt weird to me that mm-hmm. it wasn't factories and like large entities. And the way yeah. that they're doing this, I can imagine players being able to build factories, refineries, things on various yeah. places and quote unquote own them. Uh, so let's and, and but the, the the key there is there's only so many nodes that can fit on a given object, right? So if you've got a moon True. that's dis, that's you know a small moon or a medium sized moon <laughs> or whatever size, uh, then it's going to have room for. Up to you know, it's it's only got three population nodes, and as something with three population nodes only has the space for a total of you know five factory nodes, one entertainment node, and one other thing. So maybe it starts with a few of those nodes missing, and if no players ever put anything there, the computer can do some algorithms and decide, okay, based on the past four weeks in game time, uh, there have been these needs and this much. Uh, available supply of these items, so we should build this factory here in order to take advantage of that. So NPCs, again, would jump in where players don't. But that would just seem like... And then, of course, you could also sell a factory that you own for scrap when it stops being worthwhile. I mean, it would probably... You'd lose a lot of money versus if it's profitable, too. Well, and the the thing of it uh, was that uh, Chris Roberts has said that it would not be something that you could automate the process of like you have to be online and involved in the production of the factory yeah uh, so you know we already know that that's not going to be the you know like in you mentioned railroad tycoon for example where you know you built you built a lumber mill to you know handle all the forest tree needs from a nearby area and then sell the finished good elsewhere you know but you would just tell it hey this train's going to run a thousand runs but you don't have that option in Star Citizen. You, you have to be involved in that factory directly to make it work, which means you're not out there actually plying the lanes on your own. Well, yeah, because so, there's plenty of different things that could happen. For example, if the resources that you need to get your factory going stop coming to you because the prices that you've set are too low and somebody else put a factory you know, on a different moon in the same system that has higher prices yeah. and everybody starts bringing stuff over there, now mm-hmm. you've got a problem. So, yeah, you, you have to keep on top of it. I can't imagine that somebody who just buys a factory that's in a good place and then leaves it there is going to make nearly as much profit as somebody who's micromanaging it. I mean, they've also talked about how you can have your workers' morale is going to matter. So if you're <laughs> the node that your factory is located in doesn't get enough contraband and luxuries, then yeah. your factory's efficiency is going to go down. And maybe so, parts sort of wear out and the factory's quality goes down over time. And you have to you buy new upgrades. parts and pay for upgrades. Yeah, and when to make that payment is a big deal. That that just sounds like a <laughs> cool thing to, to deal with. Uh, yeah, it, it, it should be an interesting part of the the economic game. Versus the combat game. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Of course, oh, they have to also be blow upable, right? You have to well, be able to pay for some 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 espionage, some industrial sabotage, where you send somebody in to the factory and they put plant some C four charges and boom, down comes the factory. <laughs> well, there's that, or you just start, you know, you you pay somebody to lower the morale of all the workers Ooh, in the factories. Oh yeah. You just yeah, you, you just spreads dissent. Strike. Hey. I heard the guy who owns this factory literally has a room like Scrooge McDuck that he dives into full of cash, <laughs> and he hasn't raised your wages in three weeks or three years. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, that should be pretty cool. It absolutely should. So the other major thing that this game is doing different Wait, I actually covered both of them. I went from NPCs to, <laughs> to tycoon-style factory yeah. economy. Both of those things together, oh, that's the problem, though, right? These things are basically completely untested. 
We well, have there's yeah. nothing like this in any other game. I mean, tycoon games kind of have the factory thing as an example, but nothing in the scale and the multiplayer system that I know of that they can look the, at and go, "Oh, they had these problems and this is how they fixed them." We're going to have some unintended yeah. problems here. Oh yeah. Well, the the closest thing I can think of on the single player side is like X3. Hmm. Where, you know, you built you would build space stations which were factories that had their inputs. But then again, you were also organizing, you know, you're paying NPCs to make constant trade runs in that. And I, I uh, am looking forward to see what happens with this. But yeah, on a multiplayer environment, that has not been tested. We don't know what's going to happen there. Now, my, my hope is that it doesn't lead to some kind of weird, weird kind of loop that makes infinite money. But as we all know, it, it probably will at some point. Some people in the chat are pointing out that's what bombers are for. You don't send in a single guy with C4. You just drop bombs on them. What is it? Not the Retaliator, the the smaller one. The Aegis, uh... Oh, I can't remember what the top I, Avenger. Yeah. yeah, the Avenger. No, not the Avenger. No, no, the Avenger is the police the, the, ship. Yeah, no, You're I'm, thinking of the Gladiator. Gladiator, sorry. I, you never see that one mentioned anywhere. It's like the, the Retaliator's, like, baby brother that nobody cares about. Like, no, I want the big one with the torpedoes. Uh, all right. so, <laughs> well, and the eight-person crew that you can't fly on yeah, your exactly. own or cost too much. Yeah. But the Gladiator is the kind of thing you'd send in on a little bombing run to blow up some opponent's factory or something. But, with the uh, stealth package. With the stealth package. Towing a large package. asteroid oh, yeah, to make yeah. it look natural. <laughs> make it just... <laughs> It'd be like freaking solid snake in a little box. Instead, it's like just an asteroid cruising around and changing direction <laughs> on its own. Hey, Absolute, Bob, yeah. you see that asteroid changing direction over there? Yeah. Hey, when when these things get near the sun, sometimes the ice in there melts and jets out. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> Such a great idea. All right, so the final question we're going to deal with today, because I love the concept, because... Well, okay, back up. One of the cool things about this game is that they're trying to combine World War II style combat with carriers and battleships and planes and things like this with, like, the 1600s Age of Discovery. <laughs> it's yeah. it's like a weird combination because you want this, like, partly unexplored world that you're slowly colonizing, but that there's also has to be large amounts of trade between these areas because we can't travel instantaneously or quickly between one of them and some of them are more built up than others and they have different resources in different areas. So there's a lot of trade, but there's also a lot of piracy on the open seas. Yar, har, har. Hmm. That's just a brilliant combination. And one of the things that's important in that sort of concept, and there's a huge organization of organizations or sort of an organization, a meta organization called the Convoy in the Star Citizen uh, forums and sort of uh, community. The idea here is it's basically a mutual uh, a, amalgamation of various trade organizations where they will work together to plan and execute convoy runs where you have a lot of different merchantmen sort of getting together in a large group and then protect them by an even larger group of escorts because single ships by themselves or even single ships with an escort is not nearly as defensible as if you have everybody go together with a large group of escorts. So I love that idea. I'm just concerned that it will never really pan out. What do you think that they'll have to do to tweak and sort of put in the game to incentivize that kind of behavior? Well, I'd say that the players are already incentivizing if you look at the forums. I mean, <laughs> they've got a thousand people saying, oh, I'm going to see a lone pilot and I'm just going to gank him and steal the cargo. Um, so in a, in a big way, they've already got kind of a built-in environment that says that convoys are going to be handy. But then again, you've got the you know, random encounters, the sphere of influence. So they're going to have to put in like a, a pretty strong party system uh, where a party is guaranteed to all show up in the instance together. Yeah. And then uh, now we'll keep it all solid. It's also going to limit probably the maximum encounter size. So now you know your convoy is going to be six ships. So you're going to start seeing you know kind of setups for that. But... Uh, they also have to put in a lot of a lot of NPC pirates to encounter these convoys. You know things that you know when you're flying out into the most lucrative trade routes, which are a long way away, um, then you're going to want to have that bigger convoy or dedicated warships with your trade ships, things like that. So you might have two banning merchantmen, but you also have 
uh, four, you know, Hornet fighters with you. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So, Man. I mean, you know, it, the the mechanics are already there. Uh, you you may actually see a lot of just single ship traders moving around between the uh, moving around between the um, the the well known systems. But you know, when when you get out there into you know the areas where there's not much of a law, I can definitely see where the convoys would be even better because the theory is based on the model of the economy and what they want to do to encourage players to go out there um, is that those will be the most lucrative trade routes, so the ones that get you the most money per run, even time taken into account. So it's worth the risk. So I mean. I'd say that they're incentivizing that in a big way already, and that it won't be necessary per se. Maybe you're going to make a very small trade run with a ship that's highly stealth and hard to find, but to make you know real money at it, so to speak, um, you'll you'll want to have a bunch of ships, and you'll be detectable for that reason. But you're going to end up with uh, with more money overall when you're successful. I really wish I I, I hope that I'll be able to make a Q ship. That's I. I was I, reading the Honor Harrington series, and they they, they turn <laughs> some some giant merchantmen into basically carriers with a bunch yep. of smaller craft built inside and a huge huge amount of missiles built yeah. into this massive hangar, and <laughs> that just sounds See, like an awesome thing. Like, oh, I'm just a big old fat merchantman <laughs> going about my and I got guns. Uh, yeah, just... and the uh, the British tried that during the, the Age of Sail, and piracy was a problem. Um, they would have ships that did not look like British warships, uh, but they had a whole lot of cannons that you know we'd get rolled out onto the deck, or they had concealed gun ports they'd pull aside to fire. So pirates would approach, and then it was uh, you'll, you'll die if you keep doing this, or you can be arrested right now. Um, yeah, because they so, wouldn't normally uh, the, get close enough to just have a broadside full in from a normal British yeah, warship. Yeah, from, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, no one's going to let that happen. Oh, someone has let it happen. Um, and you're not expecting any guns, or maybe just a couple. Uh, and I, I hope they let that happen, too. I hope that there is the process uh, where you can you can really, like, gut a ship and then, uh, you know, replace, the you know, like, uh, all your cargo with, you know, a... a much larger fire control system and a lot more guns than you would expect. You know, I think but, the, the limitation is still going to be those hard points, but if it's got missile yeah. hard points, I can pack a lot of them into a merchantman. <laughs> I can well, just fire could be missiles along, all the day long. Yeah. Well, and it could be something along the lines of, um, you know, there are hard point conversions. Like you can convert a class 3 to a class 2, but oh, it's going to yeah. cost you a lot and not be as efficient. That's true. That's true. It should be interesting. If they do that, they may not. But it, they might, and it'd be kind of cool. Yeah, you could just fit because it's a massive ship. You could just put a spinal laser <laughs> through the uh, through the hull. Robotech is showing up again. <laughs> no, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's it's got a big merchantman. It's got a big open back door. You put seventeen spinal lasers, all pointed in the same direction. <laughs> all right. Well, point it behind you, so you, when you turn to run away from danger, you just fire. Ah, yes. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So. Or if we have fusion exhaust, just turn and run away. Hmm. Fusion exhaust. I like it. I, or no. Absolutely. It's radioactive. You won't kill immediately, but they can't have kids. There's actually a plan for propulsion where you build a giant blast shield behind your, your ship, and then there's a small port. You open it, and you throw out a nuclear explosive device. Yes. Then you close the port. It explodes and propels your ship in said direction. That is. If you're ever curious... <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a a real proposal, uh, called the Orion Project in yes. the '60s. I'm yeah, looking up right now. Yeah, Project it's, Orion. A, it's a fascinating idea. Don't be downwind of the takeoff area. That's the lesson there. Yeah, you probably can't use that to propel yourself off of the Earth. Like, <laughs> well, try not you to can, escape but no one's going to well appreciate it. <laughs> there we go. We've got. Uh... Basic principles, the different shielding. Look at there's there's a lot of detail on this thing, which has <laughs> <laughs> never really been made. Oh man! All right, so, so that's why we need the moon base, right? Exactly, so that we can and then test we can out. put some factories on the moon to support the Orion Project ships. That <laughs> yes, indeed. So, 
All right. Any final comments on the economy here? Uh, there's there's still a lot that we don't know, and there's still a lot that's up in the air. Especially, we haven't really talked anything about the exploration aspect to it, but there will be a lot of information that has to do with exploration and salvage to some degree, and finding new routes through places and piloting jump holes. I'm sure we're going to talk about exploration in a, in a separate episode. Well, yeah, and, and uh, we'll have to because that's good. they're going to need to release a lot of information on exploration before we understand what's going on there. Because I have a I'm having a hard time figuring out how they're going to satisfy everyone's need to uh, to explore, but at the same time have a fairly static universe. Now they did say they're doing some procedural stuff, so we'll see what happens. But that could also tie into the economy. I mean, if everyone's exploring constantly, how fast is this area growing? that you're trying to service with merchantmen and things like that. So that should be pretty cool. I could see them, say, starting with, like, three-quarters of the systems actually on the NAVCOM and everybody knows about Mm -hmm. them, or maybe even 66%, somewhere around there, then have a few systems actually be inhabited but not on the NAVCOM because it's like individual corporations or communities have found them and not told anybody and secretly colonized them. Uh, and then another sense. set of systems that are completely uncolonized. And when yeah. you find those, you know, NPCs will move out and start building areas and factories and growing over time. Uh, but the so I think those are going to be sort of the permanent things that get added to the universe. A, new yeah. systems and B, jump points to get to those new systems and probably jump points that are undiscovered between existing systems when the game yeah. starts. But there are going to be a lot of things that you can use the same exploring tools for to find that are temporary. Like, for example, a ship to salvage. Like a big, busted, blown-up bangle or some other large ship that's not actually... You can't repair it and use it, but it will be salvageable. And you can go there as a salvage mission and collect a bunch of stuff and make a bunch of money on it. Um, (laughs) And then once it's picked clean, it disappears, essentially, I mean, there's no reason for the game okay. to keep track of that anymore, right? And then yeah. after a certain amount of time, another one might might appear in a different system nearby or something to that okay. effect. Okay. And asteroid belts that have that are mineral rich will be depleted okay. and then they're gone. Uh, so I could see things like that being sort of the quote unquote repeatable exploration goals that disappear right. after time. Okay. Well, it sounds like we've got the uh, the framework for our next show. Yeah, well, the next show <laughs> is going to be all about the lore and the story. And okay. then the one after that is going to be all about the death mechanics and the way that that works. And then the one oh, after that times. is going to be all about the politi- politics of corporations and contractors and syndicates and green Didn't we just discuss all that with the economy? We did Sorry. a little bit, Sorry. but we'll... we'll it, it was a joke about money and politics. Ah, yes, I see what you did there. <laughs> So can I pay a special interest group to get the other guy's factory workers to unionize and then not work for him anymore <laughs> when they go on strike when I pay them off to do that? Yeah, that's a little <laughs> probably – you know, that, that's the thing too. Chris probably gets those questions all the time. I hear him answer ludicrous questions sometimes on 10 for the chairman. They're like, <laughs> can I uh, adjust the color – of the knobs in my cockpit. And it's just like, I'm thinking to myself, Chris must be like, you guys have no idea what it takes to build a a video game. Like, you just have no clue how much work it is just to change the knob on the dial. (laughs) And his answers are still better than mine, which would be, you knock yourself out. Yeah, right? Uh, So, that's the next couple of episodes. I do want to point out, next week, we're going to be doing an episode. We're going to skip, and this is, I'm kind of angry, because I had plan to do February 2nd as our next episode but that turns out it's a Super Bowl night so you know, we know so what? for those of you not in the know the Super Bowl is a game where two teams I'm just kidding here's what we'll do we'll record that episode something like early in the day on that Sunday does that make sense that way we won't be competing with the Super Bowl because I know we can give that one a shot. I don't want to force our co-hosts to record when uh, when they when they want to go to you know hang out at a Super Bowl party or something. So we'll either be recording next Sunday or the Sunday after that at an earlier time, and you'll be able to find the upcoming date on the TalesOfCitizens.com website. Right now it says mm. seven o'clock on next uh, on February second, but I don't think that's going to be the case. I'm pretty sure we're probably just going to do it next Sunday at the same time, seven p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
or as okay. it's been the last three weeks, 7.15 Eastern Standard Time. Sorry, I'm going to try to get that <laughs> under control. Hey, you know, you, you can't help that nothing works the way it worked the last time you touched it. Absolutely. All right. But uh, with that, I think we are going to uh, start heading out here. If I can... There we go. Find the right button that plays my music. I love this hanger module music. It's so cool. It's just a shame it's only a minute 44 seconds, so I can't use it for much in any of my shows. Yeah. But yeah. I wanted to use it as background music, and it barely covers half of what I needed to. All right. So that's it for this episode, guys. Again, next week we're going to be talking about the lore of Star Citizen, and that means... Ugh. I have to do a lot of reading between now and then, is what it means. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be talking all about that as well as uh, I believe we're going to be bringing uh, Tim back on for that episode whether that's going to be the topic next week is up in the air let's just say we're doing a show next week it's going to be about that or maybe the death mechanics because I want to bring Tim uh, back on the show the gorilla astronomer because he also had a lecture series where he talked about stories science fiction stories in particular and how you build a good science fiction narrative and I'd love to talk to him about that particular discussion and sort of tie that into the lore of Star Citizen. So we'll be doing that coming up in the next couple of weeks. Keep an eye on TalesOfCitizens.com and the YouTube channel if you want to be informed on the exact date and time. But you'll just tell me, right? I'll tell you. Yes. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Have a good one. This is Bridger signing off. Calafu, you guys have a nice night. They said, don't compete with the Olympics. That would be a strong word. <laughs> oh, okay, fair oh, it's, enough. It's true. It will be a little strong. Oh, man. That was, that, was, that was an okay episode. I was not happy with my performance during the, uh, the rant. I should have been more prepared it's okay. for that. I forgot that I had put it on there. <laughs> I, like, booted uh, it up. Because I made the show notes, like, last Wednesday. And I was like, this yeah. will be a good thing. But I didn't get a chance to think about it in the few minutes ahead of time and really prepare what I wanted to say. So I just kind of went right off the cuff. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. It wasn't, where, yeah, it, it wasn't up to the, the same caliber as some of my other Bridger rants. We'll have to, we'll have to fix that for next time. I, I really did get angry when I was reading that thread, though. Well, it's because you can get... <laughs> it's hard not to get mad at stupid. That's the, that's the lesson I have there. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. For me... With this one, I am not terribly pleased because my voice kept getting nasally because that just keeps happening. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Well, two things I manage in my day-to-day -day job, and like people will walk in and I will sound like a frog has gone ahead, crawled down my throat, and died. <laughs> and uh, what happened? I, I've been sitting for ten minutes. I would tell you. So, I love good times there. I think I live my life by the by the creed of XKCD number three eighty six called duty calls. Someone on the internet is wrong. Someone is wrong on the internet. Yeah, that's why I can't go to the RSI forums because not only <laughs> can I not change anybody's mind because they're all too well, not all of them, but there are too many of them that are too stupid. But I can't even get them to read what I'm saying, and that's so frustrating. <laughs> like at least if I could vent at them and tell them why they're wrong. <laughs> and try so and convince that just, them. That just tells you that the uh, the group that's trying to control the forums is already controlling the forums. Uh, could be. But really, that's why yeah. I built this show. Because now I have... Yeah. <laughs> uh, my goal here is to get uh, the, uh, the CIG to watch the show on a weekly basis and thereby be influenced by me and my opinions. <laughs> so Very there, true. I can skip the forums entirely. I'm metagaming on a whole other level. <laughs> <laughs> You need to find you need to find your own outlet if you can't use the forums because they've been beaten down. Yeah, exactly. You know, looking at it, I just realized we're at almost thirty-seven million dollars of uh, crowdfunding. Ooh, for we're gonna hit the next the next level, huh? Well, it's only a hundred and twenty-four thousand left, and I say that as if that was not a, a massive amount of money for for uh, anybody. But some people are thinking it's there. gonna hit a hundred million. Before the game comes no. out, I don't think it's going to hit 100 million. I think it might hit 50 million. I think we're going to see, over the course of the first few months of the dogfighting module, perhaps an extra three to five million will probably come in. Basically, mm -hmm. just pre-orders for all intents and purposes. 
Okay, well, let's see. They've raised... Wow, they've... So looking at it here, it looks like they've raised... The lowest amount they raised was the week bef the week after Christmas at $380,000 or so. And the most they raised was the week of New Year's at 602000 Are you looking so at one of still, those uh, Excel spreadsheets? I'm looking, I'm looking at the crowdfunding timeline. It just charts it out. Oh, so, oh in the last month you're saying. I see. Yeah, in the last week, you know, the last this last set of weeks, week 49, 50, 51, 52, gotcha, 0, 1, gotcha. 2, 3, yeah. So this is on a weekly basis, they can still pull in more than half a million sometimes. Yeah. For a product that doesn't exist, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> sure is. It's just the hope, really. What they're doing is they're <coughs> selling hope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think if we do a show next week, it can't be the, the lore one because there is so much no, I want to look through. It's going to have to be the death mechanics, the legacy and death mechanics, which is a really cool okay. concept. There's a lot we can it tie is. in there. Um, we can spoil it. Now, the com link has so much going on in it. And I did. I, I read through the entirety of the time capsule one day because that is basically the history of the Star Citizen universe condensed into articles that are from certain years and it's great it's fantastic if you guys haven't read it have you read through it i have not actually so if you go to the com link and you click on spectrum dispatch and you'll see yeah, you're in spectrum dispatch channel you go to series time capsule and then i think you can tell it to sort by old instead of new yeah. and the first post is 2075 the stars get a little closer and that's like the very first, uh, you know, person. What is that actually? It's a news article. It's a very brief one, discussing somebody for the first time. Oh shit! That was talking. The, the it was an interview with someone who completed the first self-sustaining quantum drive engine. Basically. Okay. Yeah. So that's the very first thing that happens in 2075, and then it shows yeah. the next one in 2113. And then the next one is 2120. So it, each of these represent very pinnacle moments in human history. And it slowly mm. gets up to. And the coolest thing is you don't even notice it happening. But as you get yeah. closer and closer to like 27, 2800, you realize that the government is being more and more like an autocracy. Hmm. And it's and it's coming through because these are like news reels and diary entries and various things that act as if they were records from that period, right? And yeah. eventually there's a break where you see that a lot of sort of rebellion and, and things are happening and causing stirs <coughs> and then sort of the the autocracy is overthrown and, and it's it's like a very it's a really cool thing. Let me see, where is it? The tide rises, twenty seven ninety two is okay. when they overthrow the 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 government i think huh. oh, it's just it's so cool reading through that at first i was like okay this is cool and then as you get more and more into it you just it, they ref refer back to other things and oh it's very cool and it also talks about the history of the vandal wars with the with the mm. with the various species with the sorry the and the um, the Xi'an and the others now yeah the other one that I've read completely is Cassandra's Tears, which is kind of like a serial pulp adventure. Yeah. And I really liked that one. And Tales of Kids Crimson seems like another one like that. I, yeah, I've read, I've read through a bunch of these, uh, like, like here and there is the problem. Yeah. So I need to actually sit down and go through them all in, like, order. Yeah, <coughs> going through them in order is very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, my thing these days has been the uh, overtime at work has been ramping up so i know it's been a consistent complaint of mine but you just got to do one of those things where it's like i'm going to read three of these a day just yeah right and then before i go to bed i'll just read three of them because yeah, most of them the, with the smartphone i have no excuses either there you go well. <laughs> <laughs> and so many of them are really i mean they're not that they're they're very sort of quick and short like if we just click on any random one of these it'll probably be about uh you know a couple paragraphs here yeah it's it's not that long this one in particular is a transcript of a speech uh, the heads of government around the world gather at the World Summit to discuss the next phase of global initiatives, and um, it's it's very cool. And it sort of ch charts how you know the technology changed over time. And, and uh, so here's the three pillars. This is sort of the beginning of a uh, of of 
this sort of the UEE in general, but then it becomes yeah. the the United Earth Empire, and that's when things get bad, and then the three pillars over time get chopped <coughs> down to one, and they stop being important. Only one of them is the real controller. Oh, yeah, it's very cool. So, okay. and have they discussed much about the ruling like uh, individuals of the UEE, or is that still kind of up in the air? Um, at the time the game happens. I Which think is... they still have the three pillars system. Let me see if okay. I can remember the name of them. Uh, so this is like the... Let me see. The High Secretary. The High Advocate. And the High General. So I think the High Secretary is essentially the, the domestic type affairs, like trade and things like that. The High Advocate is like law and order. So the High Advocate is kind of the, the, the judiciary. The High General is mm -hmm. like the executive, and the High Secretary is like the, the Congress, the, the legislative yeah. arm. Um, and they Fair each... Enough. And each of those has a head. Like, so the high general would be equivalent to the president. The high advocate would be like the equivalent of the, um, just, uh, um, not surgeon general. Um, the chief prosecutor. Who, who's the, uh, highest position on the judiciary branch? Not oh, the, the Supreme Court. Not necessarily. Well, maybe the Supreme Court. Maybe the high advocate would be like the Supreme Court. But what's the other one? Um, shit. Oh, the, um, I am terrible. Yeah, I know you're, I know you're thinking too, because it's, it's the, like, the, the cabinet position we have is called the... Yes, that's what I was not, looking It's not for. attorney general, but... Attorney general, yeah, that's what I was thinking oh, yeah. of. It is the attorney is. general. Um, okay. That's why I was thinking surgeon general for some reason. And then the high oh. secretary would be, like, the speaker of the house or so, the speaker of, this, of or the, something like that, I guess. Okay, all right. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, the, yeah, one yeah. one of those basically one person came. I think it was when the Vandal War started getting out of control that the one person sort of took over and never gave back any control. Well, which is something we actually worried about in the U.S. during World War II, because the same president, uh, FDR, Roosevelt, yep, Roosevelt, yeah, kept kept winning uh, those elections by massive landmarks. You know, don't change a horse in midstream, and et cetera. Right, I mean, he was and, super uh, popular, but he was also the one that took more power for the executive than pretty much any other president in history, too. So, Which, and, which and, is why it was a concern. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was wartime, and they created, they basically took over the economy and made it a, you know, a government-run economy for a while during the war. Mm -hmm. You, basically, they told Ford, you can't make cars. You're not allowed. Yeah. By law, you can't make cars now. You're making tanks well, You're going to make his parts for tanks and jeeps and yeah. Yeah. So, and yeah. I mean, because of the sentiment at the time, everything worked out. And because we had, you know, good people at the time, they were able to let it go back to a civilian economy when the threat was over. And they didn't, like, hold on to it like a dictator would. And that was the yeah. idea behind uh, the Roman system, too. Yeah, the that's consoles. what that's where the word dictator comes from. It was a temporary position where you elect someone to have ultimate power when there is some kind of an emergency and the system of government that's distributed can't resolve it. It's too intractable. So you put one person yeah. in charge to make results happen, but then they step down afterwards. And it's a huge sign of respect when you're made dictator because you're basically putting your trust in them to give back the power afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes sense, but these guys aren't giving it back, as it were. Oh, Vin's right. The attorney general is in the executive branch, technically, but I think might be the chief justice, I guess, of the Supreme Court is probably go. the chief example justice. of yeah. the high advocate. That's probably the best. That was what I could here. remember. Chief justice of the, you know, is the Supreme Court? No, it's not. There's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, that's all. It's it's really cool. I also really enjoyed Cassandra's Tears. That was a great little story. I think it comes yeah. in like eleven parts, and each part is. You know, some two thousand, three thousand words. It's not like a book. It's it's a it's a small novella, I guess you could call it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to end up taking you know that many hours to Listen, read or something. If you just take your phone with you to the bathroom every time you read through one of the one chapter, you're good. After a little while. I have such a hard time with people that read the, that phone in the bathroom. <laughs> do you 
Do they not know how, how smell works? <laughs> <laughs> Just leave it in the pocket, guys. Leave it in the uh, pocket. <laughs> well, yeah, on, on a totally unrelated note, but one that just I I was mystified. This guy is in the bathroom, and he's he's washing his hands. And when he's done washing his hands, he dries them off. And he turns, he reaches out, grabs the handle, turns it back on, puts his hands under the under the sink, fills his palms with water, and then drinks from his hands. Huh, and I thought. Well. But, but what did you just grab on that handle? Because I haven't washed my hands yet, and I guarantee I touched that piece of shit. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's why the automatic turning on handles are good, right? Well, yeah, the, I'm with you there. I'm not arguing. We didn't have to have one in that bathroom, but nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> the post-show just turned into a discussion of bathroom etiquette. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> we well, if, have... you, if you want to go that route, I have some stories. Yeah. Well, listen, no, I'm just teasing. I, work in, <laughs> I work at a hotel, and there oh. are certain groups, especially the ones that have a lot of little kids, like when the cheerleading competition comes to the convention center next to our hotel, the, uh, the public bathrooms in the, in the hotel are just covered shit. in glitter, just covered oh. in glitter. I just hear the, the housekeeping staff will tell me these horror stories. It's like there's so much glitter. It takes an hour to clean up all the glitter in there. It's ridiculous. And there's other yeah, of groups of people. all the problems people, you could have. Right? Yeah. <laughs> there's, other, there's certain groups of people that will come into the hotel, and after they leave, they'll just, like, find shit in the stairwell. Like, the people oh. have just gone in the stairwell and taken a shit. And you're like, why didn't people do that? that? That's not good. No. No. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense. You have a bathroom in your room. Well, sometimes that's, you know, not convenient enough. Or it's too convenient, <laughs> really. Yeah. Uh, the biggest one that they have a problem with sometimes is actually when Kineticon comes around, and it's only yeah. been a been a problem recently. Kineticon is uh, is basically a geek gaming con. Well, gaming, okay. anime, it's, so it's called Comic the Connecticut Con, Everything but in con. Connecticut. Yeah, they mostly focus. I'd say about fifty percent anime, um, and then fifty percent games, including tabletop games, board games, video games, all kinds of games, right? And uh, so the convention center is sort of right next door to the to the hotel. But because this started as an anime con, it's always had a huge chunk of the the people that go there are like age 14 to 18. Like they're in the high school bracket, right? Because that's, that's a big portion of the anime audience is in that high school bracket. Yeah. Because a lot of anime, yeah. let's let's just get to it. A lot of anime is very immature. Now there's a lot well, of mature anime too. But a lot of people no, that get addicted to anime get addicted in that phase to the yeah. the less mature. Say, the anime. primary target is different than the audience that watches all of it. I mean, I've right. watched Invader Zim, but it was intended for school children. Sure. Not for me. <laughs> well, yeah, and the same thing can be said for a lot of shows. But yeah, the point of this is you get a lot of high school age kids that have hormones going crazy, and they have a rave on Friday night and on Saturday night. <laughs> And from the people that staff those events at the hotel, oh, man. the problem is when they, when the room, when, when you're at a hotel and you've booked a ballroom or a meeting room for this time to this time, yeah. when that time is up, you got to go. You're out. You're out. Yeah. You got to go because the staff only stays to a certain time and they got to flip the room yeah. so it's ready for the next time. They've got to change the yeah. chair configuration. They've got to vacuum the floors. They've got to do all this stuff. And they're, they're expected to get off their shift at this time, go home, go to sleep, so they can come back and be at a shift at tomorrow to serve you again. And they have to kick everybody out of the thing and they don't want to leave because they mm -hmm. think the rave ends at like 1, 1 a.m. or something like that. Now, in the but past, it's been... Three. And nobody wants to go to bed until 3 or 4 a.m. because it's Kineticon. Yeah. It's, it, so the problem is, in the past, <laughs> they've just gone back to the convention center in droves, just go, just kicked out of the rave. They go back into the convention center because they used to have the exhibit halls open for a long time, uh, like till 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. But the convention center didn't want to do that either because they have their own staff they want to send home. So... They now cut it so that the convention center closes at midnight, even when the before the rave closes. So now when the rave is over, everybody just stays in the lobby of the hotel and nobody oh. goes anywhere. Oh, perfect. To just stay there and talk and hang out because nobody wants to go to bed yet. But not everybody even has a room in the hotel. That's what I don't get about some of these cons. People will show up and have nowhere to sleep and they'll go into the screening rooms in the hotel 
and they'll be there and they'll just fall asleep in these uncomfortable chairs in the screening room that are showing various anime movies and things like that. And that's happened at PAX too. They have to, huh. they, they close the PAX gaming rooms for like five hours in the wee hours only because they want to force people to leave and take a shower. Like otherwise people just <laughs> wouldn't leave. They'd go into a corner and fall asleep rather than go find some place to actually sleep. It's ridiculous. That, yeah. See, now, if you can sweet talk yourself into a room, but if you're just sleep in a chair, that's it. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, I can't believe uh, how fast PAX went. Did you ever go to PAX? I have not. I keep wanting to go up there, but usually I end up being busy when it's happening. Yeah, because you're in California, so, right? Yeah. How long is it a drive yeah, up to Seattle for you? Is that oh, like a, to Seattle? All right. Well, it depends on how like crazy you want to Twelve-hour drive get, or something. Uh, right in there. I mean, it's from here. It's about seven to San Francisco. I think if I if I went nonstop, it'd be twelve hours. So that's doable. the trouble is that's doable. Yeah, it's doable if I went on my own. Wife, kids. Yeah, oh, it's going to well. be at least an eighteen-hour drive. Gotcha. You'd probably have to make it overnight. Yeah. Um, the uh, the thing is, there is a train that runs from. Uh, Los Angeles to Seattle. Train. I, I'm sorry. Train. I'm from America. I'm not sure what this train thing is. Yeah, and it ends up being a 30-hour <laughs> train ride. Really? I was blown away. Yeah, you have to stop and switch trains and wait. Yeah, it, I just was mystified yeah. at how long it took. And the price was twice what the plane tickets cost. So it's about a three-hour uh, three flight. Yeah. Which is more than doable. I mean, from from my place to to Boston, it ends up being like five and a half, six hours ish. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind time zone changes. But <laughs> yeah, I've been to PAX East every year since it started, which is I think 2010, mm. 10, 11, yeah. 12, 13. Yeah, I've been four times, and they've got a great location <coughs> now. The first place they opened at, they weren't. It wasn't that big because they weren't sure how many how many how, how many people were going to come, but it was. Mm -hmm. Way too crowded, but they they got the the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center BCEC, which is huge and definitely big enough yeah. for their purposes. But uh, PAX is a really great experience. The problem is now everybody wants to go, so yeah, it sold I, out instantly. I got in line for tickets, quote unquote, in line in digital yeah. line about yeah. twelve minutes after the tickets opened, and I could not get a three day badge. Ouch. I had to get two one-day badges. I could have got the third, uh, but I just didn't but, want to spend that much more money. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that, this is, that sounds like a massive demand. Like they need more shows. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's true. They've got PAX Aus now they had. Um, I don't know if they're going to have a PAX like south, like in Dallas or something. Well, you, you need to have one. So they have, they have one in Seattle. They probably ought to do one L.A., San Diego area. Uh, one, yeah, south or Midwest kind of thing. The um, problem is so many people go to the same, go to go to all of those, right? If you yeah. make more of them, you know, you might just be, the staff won't be able to. Yeah, you're them. you're going to be uh, cannibalizing from your own sales. Well, not even from your sales, but I'm talking about the people well, that staff the events and also the oh, oh, yeah, yeah. like the companies, right? So <clears throat> EA goes to all of these things, Ubisoft goes to all of these things, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> That's All right. very true. I'm going to shut right. down the stream. We not had a nice long after show here, but I've got Yeah, we did. I've, I'm not actually, talking about Star Citizen. <laughs> yeah. So we'll be back next week. Uh, we'll figure out what we're doing. I think we'll do the death mechanics one because that one, that one should be fun. That sounds good. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go bone up on death mechanics. Yes. No, no pun intended. <laughs> okay, it was okay. a little intended. It might have been. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. See you later.